Well, uh, thank you for having me, Erica. Um, I uh, always appreciate the opportunity to educate people um, on uh, what happens when you call 911 and what to expect out of uh, the providers that arrive at your house, uh, no matter what they are. Um, so um, with that, we'll, we'll get started. Um, first, a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I'm an AMS instructor here at uh, Providence, um, formerly NHS. I started full-time instructor about three years ago um, as a paramedic um, program director. Um, I've been in EMS for 30 years um, full-time. Um, I first started as an EMT in Seattle, uh, became a paramedic in Tacoma, and then uh, went further south and then decided to come here east in about 2014 as a paramedic. I worked primarily at um, AMR, um, but I've also worked at several other agencies. Currently, I am a chaplain for uh, Spokane Fire District 4 up north. Um, uh, obviously, they've been busy the last couple of days with the, the fire and health. Um, I've been doing that for a couple of months uh, after uh, semi-retiring from the field. Um, I grew up in New York State. Uh, this picture here on there, um, if you can see my cursor, that is actually my dad. Um, so I've been in, around EMS since basically the dawn of time, um, or at least the time of EMS. Um, and I've been able to work in multiple areas. I've worked in Seattle, I've worked in Japan, I've worked in all sorts of wilderness areas, logging country and stuff like that. So I've seen seen quite a lot. Um, and uh, for those of you, I am work, I am used to teaching online a little bit, so I can kind of monitor the chat some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, I don't mind being interrupted. Um, I teach. Uh, and I like to do more of a discussion. I know it's a little bit harder online to do uh, discussion, uh, but anytime you have any questions or anything, to chat or Q and A, um, I can get through those. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so I like to give a little brief history. Um, the modern EMS system started in 1996 or, or 1966. Sorry. Um, there was actually a paper done, and we were having a lot of fatalities and a lot of disability in, uh, on the roadways. Those of you that may remember back in the 60s um, and early 70s, there was not a lot of safety devices on our vehicles. They were all metal, they were real fast, uh, and they caused a lot of death and disability. So um, it didn't go unnoticed, so they decided they would start doing something about it. Um, so uh, they did a study and they found out that a lot of people were dying. Uh, so they decided we need to do something about it. Um, so really EMS as a, as a profession is relatively young. Um, so I'm second generation uh, EMS and pretty much my dad was the first generation of any EMS. So um, it's not a long history. So 911 was actually dedicated, uh, the dedicated number in 1968. Um, and believe it or not, uh, when I left my hometown in upstate New York in 1988, uh, we still didn't have 911. It was a local number um, that I still remember to this day, 988-2222. And that just got you through this dispatcher and then the siren uh, the town siren would, would blow, and that would you know, tell all the volunteers to go pick up apparatus to go to the call. Um, you know, we didn't have all this fancy communication, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have uh, um, you know, two way pagers and all that stuff. So um, that's how we did it, or how they did it back in the day. So the EMT um, uh, profession or level of service. Uh, started in the early 70s, and paramedic was soon after that. Um, so uh, some of you uh, I may remember um, the show Emergency. 
Um, that actually is kind of a cool show. I used to watch it with my dad all the time. Um, and it kind of depicts the start of paramedics in LA uh, County back in the early 70s. Um, there are several cities that started out in EMS. Um, one was Seattle, that was one of the pioneers. Um, Miami, LA, I believe Cleveland was another one. Um, and they started uh, training paramedics, which um, it actually was a lot of what they used were uh, Vietnam veterans that were medical in Vietnam. Um, and they were easily retrained because they already knew trauma and all that stuff. So, so uh, in the mid mid seventies, they came up with a standardized or somewhat standardized curriculum. Um, EMTs and paramedics were originally um, under the Department of Transportation. When I started in nineteen ninety three, uh, we were still under the Department of Transportation uh, and not the Department of uh, Help like we are nowadays, um, uh, which is is kind of weird. Um, but that if you understand where the history of the white paper that came out in 1966, it was all done by the Department of Transportation. So that's why we kind of started with the Department of Transportation. Um, and now we are, uh, as far as federal, it's uh, Department of Homeland Security. Um, and then uh, the state, it's the Department of Health who kind of regulates us um, as far as our certifications and who can transport and who can be an agency and all that stuff. <clears throat> so that's that's a, a brief uh, history. Um, we're still, I like to talk about uh, science-based medicine. Uh, we didn't start doing science-based medicine here in EMS until 2012 because it's hard to do studies in the field. Um, there's, you know, it's emergent situations, and if you know something is working, then you, you use it. Um, but it's it's kind of weird how we haven't. It was all done based on what doctors thought there. There's a lot of theoretical uh, stuff. Medicines, even to this day, the stuff that we use as paramedics, not all of it is proven. Um, we just do the best we can um, with what we have. Uh, so that's a brief history. So let's talk about the uh, levels of EMS because there's a lot of confusion um, about uh, the levels. You know, they'll call uh, everybody that shows up a paramedic, or they'll call an EMT or an ambulance driver. Uh, we really don't like the uh, the word ambulance driver. Um, as me in my last several years um, of being a paramedic, I never drove any jets. Um, so I wasn't really an ambulance driver. Uh, I usually was in the back treating the patient. So we have several uh, uh, levels of service. And these are, um, some of these are recognized in the National Registry, who is kind of a a testing uh, uh, organization that helps test and um, kind of educate the responsible for creating education um, for EMS. So uh, basic life support, which is they can do basic stuff, uh, like an emergency uh, medical responder or EMR. This used to be called a first responder back in the day, but now first responder is kind of a a uh, generalized term for all of us. It's the police, fire, EMS. Um, it really, they, you can include public works and all that stuff because we're going to scenes um, of emergency. So an emergency medical responder, basically they can do uh, a little bit of oxygen, they can do oxygen, they can do CPR, they can do some, a little bit more advanced first thing type steps, splinting and bandaging and bleeding control and stuff like that. Uh, the education, um, this is real good for the rural areas where people don't have access to a lot of um, a lot of education opportunities. Um, so in our more rural departments, we'll see a lot of emergency medical responders. responders. They can also uh, be intended in 
in the front of the ambulance, so they can actually drive uh, an ambulance, uh, whereas um, the other ones can as well, but uh, EMTs can uh, the more advanced are usually in the back of the patient. So another basic responder is a uh, emergency medical technician. So these guys, uh, these folks can do, they have a little bit more education for us. We do staff here, not to use all these levels, but uh, the EMT has about three months of training, um, pretty a lot more advanced than that, than first aid. So uh, there's about uh, eight or nine, depending on where you are, eight or nine medications they can give or assist in giving. They can give oxygen, they can give um, breathing treatments that, uh, for albuterol, nitroglycerin, aspirin um, for, for uh, cardiac patients, um, and Narcan, of course, um, and a few other medications they can give. Um, and here in this county, we have a lot of a lot of EMTs. Um, usually, in an ambulance, you're typically going to see either two EMTs, or you're going to see, um, or you'll see an EMT and a paramedic. Occasionally, you'll see a paramedic. I run two paramedics, but that's pretty rare here in this county, especially now. So then we get into the advanced life support. Uh, these uh, people have uh, some advanced skills. So there's an advanced EMT, uh, and they can do IVs. Um, they can do um, some, a few more medications, depending on where they're from or where what county they're working in. Uh, so they can do a little bit more advanced stuff. Um, and then there's the paramedic. Paramedics are uh, more highly educated and uh, a lot more uh, time in school. So we have a program which I run. Uh, it takes anywhere from 12 to 14 months. Um, there's paramedic programs out there that are um, anywhere from six months to uh, about two years, depending on, on where you go. Um, and typically they're in person, they're intense, they're uh, a lot of education, a lot of what we talk about is cardiology. Um, so it, with a paramedic, um, and uh, this is kind of cool, um, talking about studies, we can, if somebody's having chest pain and calls 911, they will actually, if you're in Spokane specifically, uh, and a lot of other places around the, the world where there's paramedics, they will actually get seen or get to the cath lab where they can get that, that uh, life-saving intervention. They will get there quicker if they go uh, in an ambulance as opposed to driving themselves or having someone drive them to the hospital because it takes longer for them to get through the whole emergency room and then get up to the cath lab for that, that life-saving intervention. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of that fact. So we, as paramedics, we can do 12 leads. We can start medications, uh, depending on where you're at. There's, there's a lot of things paramedics can do. And then we can also call the hospital and say, hey, this person is having a heart attack and um, this is what's going on. And literally they can, some places you actually go directly to the cath lab based on what the paramedic is telling the doctors in the ER. Um, there's a lot of different uh, ways to, to go about it. Um, and every county is different, but we can do a lot of life-saving intervention in, in the back of the ambulance while we're going to the hospital. Um, and this is kind of what what our paramedics are really, really good at because they can identify a heart attack, they identify strokes, identify uh, all sorts of these medical problems and have to give a heads up uh, to the hospital so they can mobilize. When I started EMS back in the day, um, we didn't really activate. We were actually a lot like just ambulance drivers. We didn't do a lot of stuff in the back of the ambulance. Uh, but now we're getting so advanced. We're like a mobile emergency room on the years. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac arrest. 
Um, so there's other levels uh, of paramedic uh, that are not necessarily nationally recognized, but they're they're just more education, and depending on where you work, they can uh, be. Uh, they're just advanced certification. So there's the, the critical care that the CCP is there for. Critical care um, paramedic. Um, there's flight paramedics. There's industrial paramedics. There's tactical paramedics, um, which are specialized in going into uh, you know hospital environments and they're wearing full gear and all that stuff uh, um, against weapons and stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of there's wilderness. There's a lot of a lot of more advanced education um, to do that. So that's the level. So the biggest ones you're going to see out here in Spokane are uh, EMTs, uh, EMTs and paramedics. With uh, there's there are several advanced EMTs as well here in Spokane and in the surrounding area. Okay. So what happens? Uh, when we call 911. Um, uh, first of all, here it is 911 is our emergency uh, number. Um, I always say if you're in doubt, call. Now, 911 obviously is in a place to find out power outages and stuff like that. If there's live wires down, for instance, that's something to call because the fire department keeps down the security area. Um, and then we can, they can also get a hold of the power company and, and get to the shut down. So uh, anytime anybody's hurt, uh, severely uh, call. And I always say when you're in doubt, when you have a question, just call. Um, I've also called sometimes uh, when it was an emergency, but we have crime check here, which is it's kind of a backdoor to, to dispatch, which is nice. Uh, but in some counties, there is no you know, other number, so you can call up 911. If it's not a true emergency, you can say this is an emergency call, and they'll be fine with that. But if you're, if you, you have any else, just call them. So <clears throat> things you should know, you should know the address or your location where you're calling from. Uh, with the advent of, uh, you know, since we've had, everybody's got these cell phones, um, it does take permission, but they can actually ping your phone and uh, they can get your location from there. Uh, that is if you're in self-service. Um, I was just up in uh, Glacier National Park this weekend uh, doing some hiking, and there's a lot of places you don't have any self-service. So uh, hopefully you have a GPS or, or something that, uh, or a satellite uh, device that you can actually communicate with in case of an emergency. <clears throat> But know where you're calling from um, the best you can, right? Know your address. Uh, you know, in schools, they do a real good about teaching kids to know the address. And then they call 911, they know uh, where the people come. Um, so the call takers, uh, they are trained. They're very well trained. Um, some of them have also been field members. I know plenty of dispatchers that have been EMTs and paramedics and law enforcement. Um, some of them have that. There's actually a uh, EMD, emergency medical dispatch uh, class, which uh, pretty much all of them are required to take nowadays. Um, and they have standard questions that they ask. So some people get frustrated because they're just asking and asking and asking. They, if you say, okay, I have somebody short of breath, they can't breathe, it kicks them into a script that they need to go down because they need to know what kind of services they need to send. Or if you're having a burglary or something like that, they, they have a script that they go down um, depending on what the initial complaint is. Um, so don't get frustrated. The good thing is, is the person you're on the phone with is typically not necessarily the person that's dispatching fire, EMS, or law enforcement. They're, there's different people that, and they're communicating. A lot of times they're in the same room, sometimes they aren't, but they're always uh, communicating. They're writing notes in the computer. If anybody's called 911, uh, you can hear them typing away. Uh, and they're, they're very close. You actually have to type so fast to be able to be eligible to be this after. So um so depending on your response is where they 
what they will send. Um, and sometimes, uh, like here in Spokane, we have a they have a system of how they dispatch medical and, and trauma calls. Uh, and it's a it's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. So the Alpha would be like a lift assist or something not really super emergent. And then the echo would be somebody in cardiac arrest or, or not breathing or something like that. And all of those will, depending on what level, it'll they have automatic cards that like the dispatcher says, okay, this is an echo call. They'll send a couple of different fire apparatus, an ambulance, uh, probably a safety officer from the fire department. They're going to send a whole lot of people. And a lot of times law enforcement also, if they're in the area, they'll get dispatched as well. Or if they know what's going on, they'll show up. So if law enforcement shows up, it doesn't mean anything bad's happened. Um, it's just a lot of times they're in the area. When I worked rural up over on the west side, uh, the sheriff's department was showing up on scene all the time because they were able to um, uh, they could at least get something started, and they were usually closer than upset certain times. So, um, they're going to send what help they need, and if you're talking, and initially they say, oh, this isn't really that bad of an emergency, they're going to send this, and then if you say something, oh, um, if, if you say something that maybe puts them in a more severe call, they're going to upgrade that call. Um, so dispatchers are trained very well uh, to figure out what's going on. Um, plus they have scripts and all that stuff, uh, which is actually uh, scientifically vetted as, as well, too, which I think is uh, pretty good. Um, as a general rule, hang up last. Answer their questions to the best of your ability and just hang up last. Um, even if um, I've been on several calls where I show up and they're still talking to dispatch. Um, and you'll either hear them say, oh, is, are, is you know, the fire department there or uh, ambulance there? Um, and then they'll be okay with you. Think. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just want to get more information so depending on what's going on. So um, any questions about calling one one one? All right. So uh, I know a lot of people uh, get confused because I called an ambulance, right? I called 911 because I'm having a, a tummy ache or something like that. So why do you get a fire truck and an ambulance and law enforcement and sometimes other people show up, right? Uh, maybe, maybe a fire department in a pickup truck or something like that. So uh, the way systems are built in every county, uh, in every state, their EMS systems are, are set up differently. Uh, we have a joke, if you've seen one EMS system, you've seen one EMS system, because there are no two exactly, exactly the same. Um, because, uh, for instance, paramedics can only, in Washington, can only practice in one county or in the counties that they're certified in. So EMT is a state certification, paramedic is actually a county. Uh, so currently I can only practice in Spokane um, because that's where I'm getting on the education and stuff like that. That's where my agency is from. So um so why do they send a fire truck? Well if you notice there's fire stations all around especially in big cities they have them their whole purpose is to be within anywhere with, within eight minutes, right? Uh, because that's that's typically what they need to get. And this was originally designed for firefighting. Um, they could save more houses and structures and people if they're within eight minutes. Uh, EMS was kind of, in certain areas, was just formulated after fire. This fire department has been a, long around for for centuries, right? And volunteer fire great brigades even in, in the uh, early colonial times. Um, but they didn't have EMS systems. Um, so that's why you get uh, and here in Spokane, um, most of the departments 
Um, not all of them, but most of them have paramedics on their engines. Um, so they're non-transport, they don't do the transporting, but they're able to take care of uh, people with, uh, with medical problems, cardiac arrests, um, you know, traumas, all that stuff. So that's why you're going to get a fire truck. They're closer and they're, uh, they have the same thing. Um, and then the ambulance uh, is there for the transport, right? So, and the ambulance might be closer at the time. So you might get the ambulance showing up. Uh, the paramedics on the fire engines and the ambulances are uh, have the same training. I train for the fire department. Uh, as well as uh, the ambulance companies, uh, Deer Park Ambulance and um, AMR, um, and even some of them, like Sheriff's Ambulance, Pondered, um, Paramedics, for the EMS. We, we train for everywhere. Um, so they have the same training, um, both fire department and ambulance. Um, and law enforcement, like I said earlier, sometimes they just show up because uh, maybe there's something, maybe, uh, you know, on, on cardiac arrest, they just want to get anybody there. That, um, on, on car wrecks and stuff like that, they're going to, of course, help with traffic control and investigation and all that stuff. So, um, and when somebody dies uh, in, the, in the home, uh, unless it's like a hospice situation, um, even then law enforcement will be dispatched there. And again, it doesn't mean that anything's wrong. It's just that's the way if, if there's an unintended death that's outside the hospital, um, law enforcement has to be uh, involved and they do the, the primary report before they get to the corner and the medical examination at that site. So, uh, Fire department is also real good at doing other assistance. Um, so they do lockouts and stuff like that here. Um, it's, it, again, different systems, uh, the different counties are different. Uh, for instance, here, they have a water rescue team, uh, the fire department does. Uh, in other areas, it's actually the law enforcement that does water rescue. Um, so, it, you never know, and dispatchers only don't know what resources they need to decide. So, hopefully, that uh, you know, a lot of people get upset that all these apparatus show up and it's a lot of a lot of money. And, um, but that's what they're trained for, they're trained to be able these incidents, whether it's um, you know, medical trauma, hazardous materials, uh, rescue, they have all sorts of training, and that's why you'll see. Um, for instance, water rescues here in this county, um, they get a lot of apparatus um, because the river is moving swiftly. They've got to get people downstream and stuff like that. They have, uh, the fire departments have specific teams that are fire rescue or uh, water rescue or technical rescue or hazardous materials. They have, actually have special teams that they're at different stations and they'll be dispatched for those certain incidents. So, so what, what can you do for us when you call 911? Um, give us any kind of special directions, right? Identifying the house, describing the house. Um, actually, one thing I should put on here have um, having address signs that are visible. Um, with the advent of GC, uh, GPS, it's, it's easier for us to find stuff, but we still need to be able to see the house numbers. Uh, so make sure they're very, very visible uh, from the street because uh, you'll see ambulances and fire trucks occasionally go by the address because you can't see the signs. Uh, some districts, uh, I know District 4 has a, uh, they go out and put signs in the rural areas uh, at the driveways that have the, the address numbers. Um, so they're easy to find. Um, so make sure they're they're very identified, especially at night. Um, I worked a lot of nights, 
and they were working a lot of hours in the middle of the night, and you cannot see uh, houses. <clears throat> so give them directions, give them descriptions of the houses. Um, out in the rural areas, there's, um, you know, you'll have these driveways where there's multiple residents on, on a driveway off the main uh, road. Let us know if it's a right turn, you know, or you go, you know, a quarter mile and you take a right and then you go another half a mile and you take a left. Uh, do whatever you can to, to help. Uh, and again, having having signs in those situations where you have a sign at the road and you have like another sign at whatever offshoot you have. Um, I remember going out in the middle of uh, without logging uh, accident. Um, there was a lot of confusion because we could not. You know, if anybody's been out in the woods and trails and stuff, there's just multiple directions you can go. And luckily, my partner was smart and knew exactly where we were going. And now she was able to get us there quicker than anyone else. So let us know if there's any dangers as well. Um, if there's any animals in the, you know, uh, in the house. Dispatchers are real good nowadays. They'll have you put animals up. Um, because that's just one thing, um, you know, we have to be careful. When people are sick, even the best dogs uh, are their protectors, right? And um, though I've never been bit, I've been snapped at, I've been growled at, um, I've been bugged at. Um, I've been yelled at for not going in when there was a Rottweiler in the house that was barking at me. And they're like, well, the, the animal's just fine. And I'm like, but I don't know that, right? I'm a stranger to that ain't And they're going to protect their people. So. Um, horses. It's, again, we have a lot of horses up north and, and out in the rural areas. Make sure they're put away. We have a lot of people that are actually scared of horses and they can be unpredictable. So any kind of danger that, that we might encounter, uh, do the best you can to, to let us know. Um, that really helps us. Um, some other things uh, guiding us in, you know, if, if it's a if it's a rural place or you're on a farm, have somebody at the road to flag us in if you have that uh, availability uh, to guide us in. Um, as a bystander or a patient, give us any information you can um, about the patient, anything that's pertinent, right? You know, if, if like me, you probably don't even know that I had my tonsils out when I was four and all that stuff. I don't even know that, but uh, I do need to know uh, when I'm asking them to talk about the patient. I need to know any kind of changes, changes in the medication, changes in their uh, generalized health, um, what medications are they taking. So, you know, EMTs and, and paramedics, um, we give aspirin and nitroglycerin and uh, maybe if, if there's pain, uh, paramedics can give narcotics as well for pain control. We need to know what they, what people have taken, right? Because there's interactions and stuff like that. So we need to know what medications they're taking, um, especially when it comes to, to pain control, right? Um, so there's a lot of interactions with alcohol. And, um, if they're taking other controlled substances, uh, we don't want to we don't want to sedate them to the point where they can't breathe. So we need to know that. Um, again, if you're a family member, gather information um, ahead of time. I'll uh, talk about food planning. So yeah, give us any information that we can uh, regarding the patient and what's been going on. Uh, I always ask what's been going on the last couple of years because you know, we get called to a back pain. Somebody's had back pain. And I ask them, hey, well, how long have you had back pain? Well, 10 years because I got injured. Okay, so what's the difference today, right? Because usually there's like an exacerbation or something that is worse causing us to fall today. <clears throat> um, so uh, pre-planning. Um, this is one thing um, I, I'm actually horrible at it myself. Although uh, when my parents were ill, um, I had all this information and I had it easily accessible. I had it 
on my phone. Um, and I was an emergency emergency contact for my parents, especially when it came to the medical. So um, this goes for, for if it's you or if it's a family member, especially if it's a uh, family member that has medical issues, uh, heart problems, strokes, uh, cardiovascular disease, um, memory issues like dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all that stuff. Um, we would like to know, we'd like to have a list of the history. Uh, the, a list of medications, really, you can get this through your pharmacy. Um, and hopefully, your people are only using them on the table. That's, uh, that's usually best. So you can you can call up your pharmacy, and when you're in there, picking up a medication, just say, hey, could you print out a list of my medications? Uh, because that's very useful for us when we show up on scene, so we can, we can tell what's going on with you and, you know, again, what medications have been taken today, what hasn't, have you missed some doses, uh, or have you accidentally double dosed, because uh, I've had that happen too, where somebody just, they took a medication and they're like, oh, yeah, they thought they didn't take it, and then they took it again, and then like blood pressure medication, you can get a little blood pressure, and then we're apart. Uh, it happens, so, but we need to, to know the best. So emergency contacts. Um, I would like, you know, we want to know anybody that can help us with that emergency if there's a uh, durable power of attorney. Um, uh, recent this is visits to the ED or the or a doctor or a specialist or uh, some people that are on renal dialysis. We want to know if they're updated on the dialysis. Um, you know, we want to know all of this information uh, because that really goes into it. Um, advanced directives, I'll talk a little bit here uh, about in a couple of minutes. Um, and then pulse forms and DNRs, I will also uh, talk about it a little bit more detail. So uh, if you see this, this picture, it's a, a file of life. There's also a vial of life. Some of the fire departments carry these. Um, and these are just a lot of times they can be put on or in the refrigerator and they have all the information you need. Uh, we are actually trained to go and look at a refrigerator. So we like to have all the information on the, uh, on the, in, near the refrigerator if possible. So get us names, um, you know, I've been in some homes, that the people are so organized and I just, I absolutely love it and thank them for it. Uh, I go up and I see a calendar on the refrigerator and it has all of their doctor's appointments. Um, and I can go look back and look at those. Uh, and then there's people that'll, every time you go to a doctor or um, an ER for sure, you're gonna get a discharge something. Keep those handy because those I use those all the time. If I see one, I'm going to look at it. Uh, again, I've had some organized patients that literally have all their discharge summaries stacked up in a nice new area, and I will look through those so I can find out what's been going on. You know, even last year, it's kind of important that you know, people are, are have uh, cancers or stuff like that. I can read. Uh, up on what's been going on, and, you know, have they had pain problems, you know, am I being called for pain uh, because their pain is control, out of control and their medications aren't doing a lot of stuff I can pass on to the doctor. So um, if you don't have that stuff, I like to see that, I like it, all organized. And if you're a family member or you're the person, have a copy uh, because i depending on the emergency, if I don't have time, I don't have time to write all this stuff down. Down, If I could just take a list, a copy of the, the medications and history and all that stuff, that is very beneficial because I'll pass that on to the hospital. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about advanced directives. So uh, advanced directives are a little bit different than the pulse form. Uh, which I'll talk in more detail about that here uh, momentarily. 
So advanced directives are also called living wills. These are legal paperwork dealing with long-term uh, issues a lot of times. The problem with this when you're calling EMS, we don't, there's a lot of legal terms and a lot of stuff. Uh, we don't typically have time to read through that and see what we want. That's something we're gonna uh, either take a copy or we're gonna deal with at the hospital. Um, it's more the long-term stuff. When, we're, when you call for an emergency, we don't have a lot of time. Although, do we accept those? Sometimes I will. If I'm if I'm working, if if somebody's in sudden cardiac arrest, I don't have a lot of time to, to devote to reading through a 15-page summary of what you what uh, family might want. Done. So we usually have to make decisions very quickly. So what we'll do is a lot of times we'll start resuscitation. So um, until we can figure that out. Uh, and we might actually get pretty far along in our uh, resuscitation uh, and then find out, well, this is not what the person wants. So at that time, we can call a doctor and we can, we can see seconds. Um, so another, uh, in Washington State, they have the living will, but they also have a separate paperwork for the durable power of attorney. So uh, some people get confused with this. Um, if somebody is alert and oriented, if the patient is alert and oriented, the, the durable power of attorney is actually not needed. But they can designate somebody ahead of time. So if they're incapacitated at any time, that person can make their medical or financial or uh, whatever decisions they want to. Um, we do run into some confusion where if the patient's alert and oriented, and we've determined they're alert and oriented, and they don't want to go to the hospital for whatever reason, as long as they meet the criteria of being able to make a sound decision, the durable power of attorney doesn't have, have much say um, at that point. Now, if that patient all of a sudden becomes unresponsive or confused to the point where they can't legally make a decision, then that's when the durable power of attorney is uh, uh, becomes, I guess, activated. So, uh, so that does that does cause some confusion uh, and has um, scenes that I get. So that's that's a living will. Um, so before we get into the pulse form, uh, I would like to talk briefly on uh, CPR and the truth about it. So about thirty-five thousand. 350,000 people die of sudden cardiac arrest outside the hospital every year. Uh, 73 of those uh, percent of that is in the home. So the likelihood of you doing CPR on a family member is actually higher than doing it out in the wild. Um, and one thing I like to stress is the survival rate is 10%. And that's of all cardiac arrests outside of the hospital. It's still 10%. Uh, it has been since I've in the 30 years I've been in uh, EMS, that has remained our overall survival rate. Um, and that is of everybody. That's people that are terminal, um, you know, hospice patients, um, anything causing a cardiac arrest, which a lot of them are not survivable, right? You'll hear uh, resuscitation rates sometimes in the uh, 50s or 70s, and they meet certain criteria. There are people that were, uh, if I have to use the word viable, they're, they're, they're people we can resuscitate. Uh, usually they're in a rhythm that, that we can correct with, uh, with an AED a lot of times. Um, so I'm not saying don't do CPR, uh, and I'm not saying don't use your AD because these, these things have really done an amazing job at saving people's lives that would have otherwise died. Uh, the DeMar Hamlin, uh, the Monday Night Football situation, that is a uh, perfect example of a person otherwise healthy. He had a freak thing happen to him. He went into cardiac arrest, CPR is what saved me uh, because they didn't have any ED right there. Every minute 
you go without CPR, your chances of survival go down by 10%. So if there's nobody to do, if, if 10 minutes goes by, the chances of you surviving a cardiac arrest with nobody doing anything is almost zero. So uh, CPR is, is very important. Um, so learn it, uh, learn to handle only CPR. It's great uh, because if if I'm out and about and I see somebody in CPR or that needs CPR, I'm going to do hand only CPR. The science has shown that it's actually super duper effective. Um, so um, I just want you to know, even if you do CPR and you do the best CPR in the world, um, you still might not get a survivor. Um, the person still may not survive. Uh, and I really don't like how the media and TV shows and all that stuff depict that every time we do CPR, uh, we get them back because that's really not the case. <clears throat> so uh, learn hands only CPR. So why do we not transport a person? Uh, EMS, we're there to try to resuscitate the patient. Uh, if they if we can't resuscitate them, we give exactly this as for paramedics, we're going to do the same thing in the ER is going to do. There's very few things uh, that they're going to do differently than we are. Um, so that's why we won't transport a person typically while we're doing CPR. Although we do have the advent now of mechanical devices, uh, which you're starting to see out in the field. Um, and we only use those in certain situations. Uh, because if somebody's terminal and they're dying from terminal cancer, the likelihood of them surviving a cardiac arrest is almost zero anyway. Um, and so we're not gonna we're not gonna transport that patient unless we get pulses back. Then we we may transport or we'll, we will transport after a certain amount of time. Uh, so currently here in this county. Um, if we've been working somebody for 15, 20 minutes or longer, uh, and we get them back, if it's a medical issue or a cardiac issue, we're actually going to wait for 10 minutes before we transport them. There's a couple of reasons for doing that. One is they get, uh, it stabilizes their heart. Their hearts, the medications we give can actually um, make the heart a little bit more irritated uh, and prone to actually going into a um, so we might not transport right away. Plus, it also gives us time to get a plan of action to get them through the hospital and, and get them out of the, the house. So that is a uh, brief uh, thing on CPR. Uh, and it is, I will say it is, it is not the prettiest site um, because uh, we are we're, we're giving, we're beating on that body. So if if they're old and frail, the chances of survival are, are, are bad. Um, not to say we aren't going to do our best, but um, a lot of times they will die of other reasons if we do get like that. So a pulse or a physician order for life safe, uh, life sustaining treatment. Uh, this was developed in, um, many, many years ago. Uh, by the state of Washington, actually, yes. one of the first ones was actually created for Spokane, I believe. Uh, and what this is, is it's it's a little bit more detailed than the old do not resuscitate. Um, and, uh, I saw that question, I'll get to it in a minute. Um, uh, physician order. So this is more, more uh, focused, I guess. If you see, this form, this is what the form looks like. This is what we like to see. Again, we look for it on the bridge. Um, so either do not resuscitate or resuscitate. Um, and then that's A. So if their heart stops beating, this is going to say, do we do anything about it or do we not? So if we do, then uh, the B is the interventions. So full treat would be. We come in, we do compressions, we do all our advanced airway skills, we give them all the medications that we possibly can uh, or that are appropriate, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to save that person. Uh, selective treatment. Um, this uh, is, is kind of nice for people that don't want to be 
you know, have tubes and all sorts of stuff sticking in them, right? So we're going to do less invasive stuff. Um, we're going to give them, you know, we're going to breathe for them, but we're not going to stick a tube down their throat. Uh, we can give them uh, more selective treatments, right? <clears throat> so we can give IV fluids or we can do a monitor or something like that. Um, and then um, you can be super specific about this. I actually had uh, a fire chief friend of mine that for his dad, he put in the additional orders, five minutes of ACLS, which includes medications and defibrillation and all that stuff, and then some separates. So you can actually get pretty specific. In this. And then there's comfort focus. Uh, this is where hospice really comes in. Uh, I'm going to give a plug for hospice because I've been through hospice uh, with both my mother and my father and my mother and mom. And the greatest resources they can help you with the pulse form, the DNR, they can, and they really focus on the palliative care. Like they can care of that patient uh, in this transition uh, uh, into death. But they take care of the family. They're just amazing people. Um, and, the, and they, they want the patient to be comfortable. Um, and then uh, these forms have to be signed by a physician or a provider um, and the patient or their durable power of attorney. They have to be signed. Because if we have all this form filled out, but there's no signature on it, we have to disregard it. So make sure it's, it's done. Uh, so make sure it's filled out. Talk to your physician about these. Um, I, I, I talk to people about these uh, because if they have some kind of terminal cancer, um, they might not want to have, have go through the, the pain and suffering of the uh, resuscitation. So uh, Judy uh, asked about Narcan for an overdose. Uh, Narcan is now easily accessible. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, narcotics, uh, especially the um, Fentanyl seems to be the big thing right now, uh, mixed with all sorts of other things and mix it with uh, methamphetamine and all sorts of other things. So with a, um, with a uh, narcotic or suspected narcotic overdose, give the Narcan. Do CPR if you can't pull, uh, if you can't feel a pulse and give them Narcan and they will start breathing or assist their breathing if you can, right? Um, have, have a barrier, I would recommend, uh, unless it's somebody you know. Uh, have some sort of barrier. Your shirt is actually a barrier. Uh, you can use that as a barrier. Um, the, the incidence of transmission of disease in uh, doing mouth-to-mouth -mouth is actually very, very rare. Um, and so don't be as concerned with that. So uh, finishing up. Um, in summary, have medical information, learn CPR and first aid, uh, have the pulse forms or the durable power of attorneys and all that stuff. Have a plan, just like, you know, uh, these fires have proven um, and COVID and all this, all this stuff we've had in the past several years. Uh, really, you need to be prepared. Be daily prepared. Some people, you know, we have a lot of these people that prep to the end of the world. How about this preparation for if there's a medical emergency in my house, having first aid kit, having uh, tourniquets. I mean, I have a tourniquet in my car. Uh, and when I'm out hiking a lot of times, I have that with me in case I need it, right? Uh, just simple plan, having all this information for us. Uh, and again, if you have any questions uh, about pulse forms, your position, uh, I'm also, I, again, I'm a, I've been through hospice three times personally with family members, and uh, I will always uh, recommend if you have somebody uh, with a terminal issue to get hold of them. So, um, thank you. I hope uh, we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions. I hope uh, this was useful. Um, we do have a friends and family um, class coming up, which is great for families uh, that have uh, elderly or people with special needs or uh, any kind of medical issues. 
Uh, these are great programs, and that'll be September 29th at 9 a.m. And you can call that number, uh, get signed up, or I also have e and put the email out on uh, the website, uh, which which they can see the courses. Are there any questions? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, just like he said, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, looks like we got to Judy's. Um, we'll hang out here for a couple more minutes if you have any of those questions. But just like Jim said, I would really, really encourage you all to look at that friends and family course. It's a great way to learn that hands-on CPR like he was talking about. Um, but otherwise, um, you're all free to go. Thank you so much for coming. We'll send you an email. Um, and yes, Heather's asking, is it possible to have access to the recording to look back on this? Yes, we will be sending out an email in the next couple of weeks that will have this recording on here and any questions that Jim has talked about, we'll put in there maybe um, some information about the friends and family course and all that great information. Um, but again, you're all free to go, but if you have any questions, um, Jim will hang on for the next couple of minutes and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for having me on and uh, hopefully you got some information.